morning, we are going to look at the closing chapter of Matthew 28. And, you know, we, we often call this uh, the Great Commission because in the, uh, in the close of Matthew 28, in fact, I heard somebody say that the Great Commission was kind of Jesus' commencement speech. It was the graduation uh, for the disciples. Uh, it's his last kind of earthly word to them as he sends them out into the, into the world and anoints them, appoints them, commissions them to preach and to teach and to baptize uh, and to go into all the world in that activity. Their commission is our commission, right? The Great Commission isn't just limited to the, to the 11 disciples, but it's upon all of us that are disciples of Jesus Christ. But what struck me, and this often happens, I don't know if this happens to you or not, but when I'm encountering a passage of Scripture that, that I'm pretty familiar with, I can start speed reading because I, I, I say to myself, or I think to myself, well, you know, I, I, yeah, I've been here many times before and I just kind of, you know, I just kind of zip right through it. And that happens so often with the end of, of uh, Matthew chapter 28 because I know what's coming. Well, this morning, uh, I want to draw your attention to the couple verses that precede immediately the Great Commission. And that's kind of where we're going to spend our, our time this morning. And so from, from Matthew chapter 28, beginning in, in verse 16, it says, Then the eleven, the eleven disciples, and remember uh, Judas has not been replaced yet at this point, so the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But the gospel writer puts in three words after that. And I didn't, you know, have a keyboard problem when I was putting the worship album together. I wanted to kind of put those in bold so they would stand out. Those three words were, but, some, yeah. I don't know about you, but I had never really picked up on that before when I was kind of speed reading into and then through the Great Commission passage. So they saw him, they worshipped him, but some, yeah. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, here's the Great Commission, Go and make disciples of, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What, what a powerful setting off Jesus gave those disciples. But this morning I want us to think about those three words uh, there in the close of, of the gospel. What? Some doubt. And so this morning I want us to, to draw deeply from Matthew 28 and to think about this matter of doubt uh, because if we're to be really honest, all of us as, as believers have doubted or have doubts or will have doubts. It's, it's simply a part and parcel of the life of faith. It's just a part of, of, of being a believer that we are going to have doubts. And it happens to the very best of us. If it could happen to the 11 disciples after they had spent three years uh, walking with Jesus and being in ministry with Jesus and serving Jesus, uh, I mean, you can't get closer to Jesus than that. And yet, here on the mountaintop, post-resurrection, in the midst of worship, some doubt. My own kind of experience as a pastor and as a believer, I kind of put doubts into two very broad categories. Uh, one is what I would call intellectual doubts. These are kind of the big questions that sometimes we struggle with as, as believers. And they're very legitimate questions, like the problem of suffering, the nature of evil. Uh, how, do I, how do I comprehend the Trinity? Uh, those are big intellectual issues or questions that, that we try to manage 
on a cerebral level sometimes. And some of those things are very difficult to just get your to get, just get your mind around. And so I'll kind of put things like that in the category of intellectual doubts. The other category is what I would call experiential doubts. These are the doubts that happen when we have, or those that we're close to, those that we love and that, that are around us, have just tragic things happen. Just hard things. And then those doubts come along about, you know, why would God allow this to happen? Uh, what, what, where, where is God? I have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about this, and yet, and yet nothing, nothing has changed. And that is born out of not just kind of the big intellectual questions, but that's just born out of experience. And so I, I would say the second category is experiential. We don't know which of those two categories is going on here in Matthew 28, but, but again, doubt is doubt, whether it's the intellectual, whether it's the experiential, or, or you, you might have another category or two that you could, uh, you could kind of add to that. But let's kind of drill down into, into this passage and get some takeaways this morning about doubt and, and how we can, how we can <coughs> do that. I want you to be encouraged this morning. And so, first of all, we begin with this. The presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. The presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. Because the 11 disciples here have faith, right? They are believers. They are there on that mountaintop for a reason, and they are in the moment and in a season and in, a, in an experience of worship. And so the presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. In fact, the Greek word that is used here in Matthew 28 and elsewhere in the Gospels for doubt literally means perplexed. Perplexed. And so maybe that might be a, a better way for us to, to think about doubt. Perplexed. There are just some things I don't get. There's a little bit of maybe confusion in my mind about how all of this works. But that's what doubt means. It does not mean and does not imply the absence of faith. In fact, I heard one person say this. I thought this was kind of, it was helpful for me. This person said that doubt is the gap between one's current faith and perfect faith. The gap between one's current faith and perfect faith. And now here's the rub. You know what? You and I are not going to have perfect faith this side of We're just not. Uh, and so I want to begin here that we see men of deep faith worshiping the resurrected Christ, but some doubt in there, those three words. So the presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. Secondly, I want you to be encouraged by this. Doubt does not make you a bad Christian, but it certainly reminds you you are really human. Doubt does not make you a bad Christian, but it certainly reminds you you are really human. In fact, you know what? Scriptures remind us there are some things about which you and I are just going to be perplexed. And I've listed a few scriptures for you this morning in your, in your worship guide. I love Psalm 139, and I uh, often uh, share this on, on various occasions, but it's talking about the presence of God, the presence of God being anywhere. And there's nowhere that you and I can ever be or ever go but what God is at present there. But in verse 6 of that amazing psalm, it says this, such knowledge, in other words, talking about God and, and understanding His presence, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty. For me to ever attain. Paul, in his letter to the Christians in Rome, in, in Romans 11, verse 34, asked this rhetorical question Who has known the mind of the Lord? Well, the answer to that is no one. Who has known completely the mind of the Lord? Jeremiah 55, 9, God says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
And then one that I wish I put in here, but I didn't, so I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29. This is, uh, this is a wonderful verse. It says, the secret things belong to God, but things revealed belong to us. And I want you to know this morning that you know, Scripture is true. And there are some things that are just secret. Here's the deal. If you and I could truly understand, comprehend everything there is about God, God would be pretty small. If Nelson Harris could understand completely and totally God, I want you to know God, God's small. God's really small. If I can fully and completely understand Him, and so being perplexed, having doubts, which again is what that word means, doesn't make you a bad Christian, doesn't make me a bad Christian, but it really reminds us of just how human we are. God is limitless, you and I are limited. God is infinite, you and I are finite. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. What is secret belongs to God. What is revealed, thank goodness, we have. So it doesn't make you a bad Christian. The 11 disciples are not bad Christians. They're not bad Christians. So I don't ever want you to think that because you have doubts or you're going through a season of doubt that all of a sudden you're a bad, you're a bad believer. That just simply is not third takeaway from Matthew 28. And this is a good one to be reminded of. You know what? Doubt does not disqualify us. <coughs> Doubt does not disqualify us. Here's what, here's what I think is so, is so profound in Matthew 28 in the context of our thinking this morning. But some doubted, but Jesus sent them anyway. Jesus sent them anyway. Jesus still kept going with the Great Commission. Jesus didn't look around in Matthew 28 and pull out three or four and say, oh, you guys are having some issues. You're still perplexed. Uh, you know, I need you to stand over here and I'll deal with you later. But now the rest of you, go and teach and preach and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and I'll be with you to the end of the age. And that is not what Jesus does. All 11 disciples are commissioned. All 11 disciples are appointed. All 11 disciples are used. All 11 disciples are qualified. Do not ever think that because you have some doubts that you are disqualified by Christ. Because if that was the case, that would be perfectly clear here at Matthew chapter 22. Fourth thing, doubt can be an invitation to a deeper faith. I like what the theologian Frederick Buckner said, and I quoted him down at the bottom of your, of your worship guide this morning there on the sermon page. He said this, this is just a good way to put it, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. And you know, the more that you and I have questions, and the more we learn, and the more we kind of struggle, and the more we wrestle with matters of faith, I want to suggest to you that that is a part of the growing and maturing process. And when we have those, those moments and those seasons, whether it's intellectual or experiential, we can move to a deeper, richer place in our walk with God. I do not have the faith that I did when I was eight years old. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I had a wonderful faith when I was eight years old for an eight-year-old. But over time of learning and studying and reflecting upon God's Word and having an experience with God and my walk with Christ, I have a very deeper, richer different faith today than I did when I was eight years old. And that is exactly as it should be. It's exactly as it 
tripping. In fact, if I had the maturity of an eight-year-old, I wouldn't be here today. And if I did happen to be here, if it worked out that way, you probably wouldn't be here where you are today. And so I want you to know this morning that as we, as we sometimes have these, as Jacob did, these kind of wrestling at midnight moments with God, you know what? It can be an invitation to move deeper, to become stronger, to grow in a richer understanding and a more powerful relationship with God. And so Jesus here, knowing that some of these disciples are perplexed, Again, that's what the word doubt means. Some of these disciples are perplexed. He uses, qualifies, anoints them anyway. And they have. So I want to suggest to you this morning, and again, we're going to keep going here with Matthew 28. What are some things that you can do with what it is that perplexes you as a believer? Three quick things. One, place those doubts before God. Place those before God. You know, God is bigger than our questions. And I've given you two scripture references right there, and they are reminders to me that God is never put off by our questions. What comes there in Mark chapter 9 is where the father goes up to Jesus and he wants healing for his child. And, uh, and, and basically the man says to Jesus, if you can, and Jesus, as you know, heals, heals the man's child. And the man gives this, this, this response. He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. You know what? You know what happens there in Mark chapter 9? Jesus does not look at that man and dismiss him. Jesus doesn't say to that man, well, you go away, and as soon as you've got it all figured out, then you come back to me and then you can ask some things. But what that man says to Jesus, just honestly and real to Jesus, is, you know, it's a little bit of us. It's a little bit of us. I believe, but, you know, there are some things I'm perplexed about. He just placed it right there before Jesus. And then, the other scripture reference there is John chapter 20. And this is the, of course, the disciples where the other disciples have experienced seeing the resurrected Jesus, and they come, and Thomas goes, you know, I won't believe it until I see it. Jesus has got to show up, and I've got to put my fingers in the nail holes and in the, in the side. I've got to see it to believe it. And you know what? Jesus arrives and says, Thomas, come here. Thomas, come here. Take your doubts, place them before God. He's bigger than your questions. He will not cast you out. He will not sweep you to the side. Secondly, process with Christians you trust. And here's the interesting thing for me. Sometimes what's in Scripture, if you read between the lines, there's some things that are implied. So I, I just want to ask this question. How does the Gospel writer of Matthew know that some of the disciples doubted? Was he there with kind of a pen and pencil in hand and, and he was got a little tablet out and so he kind of steps back and he starts observing and he goes, oh, ooh, I can tell from Bartholomew's expression, oh, he's doubting right now. The reason that it's in the gospel and the reason that the writer knew some doubted was because, by implication, they talked about it. They discussed it with one another. He was aware of the perplexities that they were experiencing. And that alone tells me that sometimes the best thing that we can do when we have questions, when we have doubts, when we have confusion, when we're uncertain, you know, get with a brother or sister in Christ that has maturity, 
that has experienced and processed that with them. Because I truly believe that's exactly what the disciples did. And that's why that, those three words made it into Matthew 28. And then third, proceed with Jesus anyway. Proceed with Jesus anyway. Here's the deal. Matthew 28, what summed down? What we know from the book of Acts, after this, the 11 disciples are out there doing amazing ministry. It's amazing ministry. I mean, the Holy Spirit is upon them and just doing powerful things through them and among them and with them. And so even in their doubts, they proceeded with Jesus anyway. Don't ever let doubt stall you. Proceed with Jesus anyway. Now this, I'm going to close with this illustration, and the metaphor isn't as good as what I would really like when I tell a sermon illustration, but I'm going to proceed with it anyway. Okay? When I was 15 or 16 years old, it was time to drive a car. And so I had gotten my learner's permit, and then of course, you know, pretty quickly thereafter got my, got my license to, to drive. And I basically knew about three or four things about, about an automobile. It was not much. Uh, I knew, one, that you had to put the key in the ignition. Of course, now you don't even have to do that. You just have it in your, in your pocket as long as you're in the car, right? You know, you know, but I knew the key went in the ignition. That was one thing I, I knew. A second thing I knew was park, reverse, neutral, drive. I knew what would happen whenever you know I shifted gears into, into one of those one of those slots. That was the second thing I knew about a car. Third thing I knew about a car was that if you gave it gas, it you know either you know it moved backward or forward, right? And then the fourth thing I knew was that when you applied the brake, it stopped. That was all I knew about an automobile at the age of, of 16. Now my father would tell you that that truly was all I knew about an automobile at age 16 because he would tell you, I did not even know where you put the gas in because he said, I never did that. I never put gas in the car. So apparently I didn't, I didn't even know where that was. Those were the four basic things I knew about the car. But I proceeded to drive anyway. Now imagine if, when I was 15 or 16 years old, I had said to myself, you know what, I will not get behind the wheel of a car until I understand perfectly how the transmission operates. And then suppose I had added to that, you know what, I will never get behind the wheel of a car until I understand how a combustible engine functions and the physics behind all of that. Or, imagine if I had layered on top of that, I'm never going to get behind the wheel of a car until I understand how all the electronics on the dashboard function and work and how the, how the circuitry is composed. I can assure you, if I had waited to know all that, I would still not be driving today. I'm a better driver, I'm a more informed driver, I'm a more experienced driver today, 40 years later, from when I got my learner's permit than I was at 15, because I proceeded anyway. You and I will never understand everything there is about God. We just want to. And again, if you think you do, the God that you're worshiping this morning is much smaller than the one I'm worshiping this morning. But we've got to be like the 11 disciples in Matthew 28. Even in the midst of our perplexities, even in the midst of our doubts, even in the midst of things that we just can't quite wrap our mind around, you know what? We proceed anyway. Jesus is going to use us anyway. And so we don't defriend Jesus. 
We don't say, you know what, I'm out of here. None of those 11 disciples did that. We place it before God, process it with Christian friends, proceed with Jesus. Knowing we'll grow, we'll mature in our understanding along the way. And so this morning, I just want you to know, if you've got doubts, you're in good company, like really good company. God's not mad at you. Jesus wants to use you. Keep going. Keep going. Let's pray again. Father, sometimes